Hollow Mind is possibly the darkest episode of the Owl House, with maybe the exception of the last episode of season 2. It is also a definite fan favorite and for a good reason. If I were to show one episode to someone who knows absolutely nothing about this show, I think Hollow Mind would be a very tempting choice because it represents all of the best things the Owl House has to offer. A well-paced, entertaining story, lovable characters, believable and often truly really heartbreaking character arcs and a lot of charm that's absolutely undeniable. Of course, that would unfortunately drop the person I'm showing it to of the setup that allowed this episode to be as satisfying as it is, but my point still stands in a sense that this is definitely one of the strongest episodes of the series. It's a wonderful storytelling that's full of interesting twists, fantastical elements, and I could spend hours talking about it and still not feel like I did it justice. And what I love about Hollow Mind specifically is how it shows off how much storytelling and development can be squeezed into a 22 minutes long time frame answering a lot of questions we had about the origins of the characters and the future of the show. The Owl House does more in 20 minutes than a lot of movies and shows can do in hours, proving just how talented the team behind this show is, managing to tell a fun and well-structured story that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. The episode opens with Luz and Hunter finding themselves in the mind of Belos. We quickly find out that they ended there by accident, and if they want to survive, they will have to find a way out as soon as possible if they don't want to end up trapped there forever. Through a walkie-talkie that belongs to Luz, they manage to contact Ida and inform her of their predicament, so that she can begin working on a spell to get them out of there. Unfortunately, because Ida doesn't have her magic to rely on, they have to wait and try to avoid Belos's inner self at all costs, which... Well, let's just say that it proves to be easier said than done. Inside the Emperor's mind, they find Kid Bellot, who they assume must be a manifestation of his strong emotions, and decide to follow him as they attempt to escape a mysterious monster that also seems to inhabit the Emperor's mind. Assuming that the monster must be the inner Bellos, they decide to hide within some of his old memories until Ida can pull them back to the physical world. There, we see Bellos at the time before the Coven system was established, speaking to a small crowd and claiming that he has the ability to speak to the Titan, and that it is his mission to spread Titan's word. According to him, receiving a sigil and joining a coven is the only way to purify one's soul and make Titan happy. He blames wild witches for losing his family and then, conveniently, the village gets attacked, supposedly by the wild witches who are trying to finish the job and kill him as well. Except we quickly find out that it's not true at all and Bellos staged the attack himself to further his own agenda. Luz calls Hunter out for supporting someone like that and tells him that there's no denying now that the Emperor's intentions aren't as pure as he thought. However, Hunter, for whom Belos is the only family he knows, still clings to his loyalty to the Emperor and refuses to accept the truth. Still chased by the inner Belos, they hop from one memory to another to find out that with the village now destroyed, the plan seems to be working. Now that they have proved that the wild witches cannot be trusted, people from the village choose to trust Belos and accept their sigils to please the Titan and in hopes that it will protect them from similar attacks in the future. This is not what happens though, since at this point Belos is still perfecting the sigil magic, as soon as the sigils are in place, they start to drain the people from their life and magic through the coven symbols. With no one to stop him, Belos steals the villagers' talisman and consumes them, Although the word absorbs might be a better fit here, really. Ah, uh, that's better. Still being on the run from the inner self, Hunter and Luz enter yet another memory, which turns out to be very different from the previous ones. There, we see the nearly completed portal to the human realm and find Bells conversing with the Collector. It's our first chance to truly see the Collector and it instantly becomes clear just how crucial he is to Bells' plans and that whatever is going to happen on the Day of Unity is bigger than anyone could have expected. The deal between the two of them is mutually beneficial with Bellos gaining the access to magic that will help him carry out his plan, and the Collector getting his freedom back. Honestly, the Collector is a fascinating character that I would love to cover in one of my future videos. Often when creating a childlike villain, it's difficult to take them seriously, but in this case, this childish persona makes him that much more of a threat. Everything seems to be a game for him, and in a lot of ways, that's truly really terrifying. The whole world is his playground, and all he cares about is whether he's entertained. He's a kid who wants to play and doesn't seem to understand the difference between right and wrong. The Collector and Bellos are then interrupted by Flashback Hunter, who hands Bellos the titan blood he got from Amity back in the Eclipse Lake, which is essential for making the portal to the human realm fully functional. Hunter is then promptly dismissed once Bellos gets what he wanted, 
and the collector uses the opportunity to make a truly disturbing comment about the emperor's relationship with his supposed nephew. Starting to think you make those things just to destroy them. Not only do we find out that Hunter is a Grimwalker, a clone of someone Bellos used to know, but I think the most horrifying thing about this scene is how Bellos says one thing, but his posture and expression say something else entirely. He denies creating the Golden Guards just to destroy them, but his smirk seems to be telling a very different story, like he's amused by this comment. Hearing that Hunter and Luz leave the memory and we can see just how shaken Hunter is, trying so hard to deny the truth even when it's right in front of his face. But then it changes. Hunter sees for himself what Bellos did to the Golden Guards who came before him as they stumble upon a cave full of discarded masks and remains of his predecessors. It's a hunting view, so many things conveyed by barely a few shots, but all the more effective because of that. And then things quickly go from bad to worse as the truth about the inner Bellos is revealed. What Luz and Hunter assume to be the inner Bellos turns out to be the source of the talisman consumed by him, morphing into a horrifying beast. And the inner self that they were supposed to be avoiding was right by their side from the very start of their journey into the depths of Bellos' mind, guiding them and slowly revealing this whole ugly truth. We weren't running from the inner Bellos. He was with us the whole time. <laughs> Bellos, finally able to shed his disguise, greets them and even has the gall to thank Hunter for distracting the creature made up of the talisman salts, which is just... I mean, it's basically rubbing salt in the wound. And then on top of that, he doubles down. Out of all the Grimwalkers, you look the most like him. Luz gets the chance to confront the Emperor herself, threatening to expose him to everyone in the Boiling Isles. He seems to be unimpressed though, and we finally learn the truth about who Bellos truly is. Yes, this has gone on longer than I'd have liked, but no one ever said being a witch hunter was easy. Witch hunter? But that's not the end of shocking revelations, as this is when Bellos reveals his true self to Luz, confirming the fan theories that's been circulating for months that Emperor Bellos is actually Philip Whittebane. And while it might not be a shock to those who followed the show for a while, it is a shock for Luz, who realizes that if it wasn't for her, Philip wouldn't have had the tools needed to proceed with his plan. It's thanks to her that he managed to get in contact with the Collector, and it means that now Belos has the draining spell which will eliminate all the witches for good on the Day of Unity. Belos attacks Luz and Hunter appears to save her at the last second thanks to the glyphs from her jacket. Now that he knows the truth, Belos no longer has any use for him and the same fate that met his predecessors awaits him. No one wants to think they've wasted their life following the wrong person. This whole episode is set in a way that really raises the stakes higher than ever before. Our protagonists finally have all the necessary pieces of information, but are also realizing that they unwillingly had a hand in helping Bellos achieve his goals. And on top of that, years of the Emperor's propaganda reached too deep for them to convince anyone that the Day of Unity won't be a celebration that everyone's expecting, but rather the end of everything they know and hold dear. It's also the episode where we can really see the full extent of Bellos' cruelty, how far he is willing to go in order to achieve his goals, even if it means burning everything and everyone who dares to stand in his way and destroying those who are supposedly close to him. While it's obvious fairly early in the series that Bellos is up to no good, it takes us almost two full seasons to realize the evil our heroes are dealing with, and that as long as he's alive, no one in the Boeing Isles can be truly safe. It also reveals Bellos to be a master manipulator. It's something that we obviously already knew, but this episode really highlights just how skilled he is. Throughout the entire length of the second season, Luz tries to prove that Bellos isn't who he claims to be, and even in this very episode, she is bitter that others fall for his lies so easily, and she tries to convince Hunter to help her expose him, ignoring the fact that with Hunter seeing him as a parental figure, he's very unlikely to change his mind. As it turns out though, she fell for his manipulation just as easily as others, tricked by Philip during her trip to the past with Lilith, unwittingly giving him just what he needed to proceed with his plans. Luz, who has so much love for this place and these people, was a key element that allowed him to succeed, and helped so many others during his rise to power and continue to abuse his position, so that he could prepare for the Day of Unity that would ultimately destroy their demon realm for good. We can see that it's something that really destroys Luz, knowing that she had a hand in the Emperor's tyranny, and especially the following episodes, such as Thanks to Them, showcase just how much she's struggling with accepting her role in all of this. This isn't the only shocking revelation, however, as Hunter's entire world 
worldview is also shaken and destroyed by the end of this adventure. Hunter's entire identity crumbles as he learns that there were no wild witches who killed his family and there were dozens of golden guys before him, each made with the explicit purpose of aiding Belos's plan and discarded by Belos himself as soon as they showed the slightest signs of defiance. You can see the sheer terror as it slowly sinks in that everything he knew about himself, his past, Belos and the surrounding him world was nothing but a lie, and that he was complicit in atrocities committed by Belos during his rule. The scene when Hunter discovers the remains of the previous Golden Guards is absolutely hunting, capturing the extent of Philip's cruelty and his lack of empathy or care even for his own creations. Despite deluding himself into thinking that he's the good guy who's doing everything for the sake of humanity, Philip doesn't seem to care about anyone other than himself, and is fully aware of the pain and abuse that he's inflicting on Hunter even though the kid genuinely adores him. He seems to view the deserting Golden Guards as nothing more than an inconvenience, seemingly creating them over and over again to feed his own ego. What's notable is that we don't know for sure whether all of the previous guards saw through his schemes and refused to cooperate. Based on how he treats Hunter over the course of this episode, almost reveling in his shock and terror as he learns about his true origins, there's a possibility that more often than not he got rid of the Golden Guards not because of an actual betrayal on their part, but rather a perceived one. Another plausible interpretation is that since Hunter and other Grimwalkers are based on Philip's brother, Caleb, they are more accurate than he would have liked, possessing some of Caleb's morals and thus preventing them from siding with the genocide that Belos is planning. Notice that Belos makes the decision to eliminate Hunter seemingly even before Hunter chooses to betray him, as we know for a fact that he didn't mean to enter Belos's mindscape and his only concern was getting out of there as soon as possible. And since it was the inner Belos guiding them through all of these memories, he deliberately made the Hunter see with his own eyes that he never cared for him. He's been just a puppet this whole time and Belos knew that there's no chance that he would still stand by his side after seeing all the memories he showed them. It's also very telling that he seems to be fully aware of how to keep Hunter by his side, using praise and reassurances that Titan has big plans for him as a tool to manipulate him and ensure that Hunter will remain royal. And it really exposes one of the most horrifying things about Belos. Despite his complete lack of empathy or compassion, Belos seems to know exactly what to say to others to make them side with him, using their own weaknesses and fears and exploiting them whenever possible. He might be unable to connect with others, but he still knows how they work and how to use this knowledge for his own benefit. I also find it strangely clever how he accuses witches of heinous acts while making a speech to a crowd made up of wild witches, because this narrative of us versus them has been proven to be extremely effective. Of course they agree to accept his coven system, not only does the titan say that they should, but who would want to be associated with murderous vile creatures who are willing to destroy villages and ruin lives to eliminate their opponent who honestly seems like a pretty decent dude and certainly doesn't deserve any of it. The psychology behind the us versus them mentality is that it creates a false sense of dichotomy between the two sides and is used to separate people into two opposing groups which are then easier to control and manipulate. When it comes to politics, and Belos certainly is a sort of political figure, people holding power are usually the ones benefiting from this kind of division between two sides, between people who actually are not so different and tend to have shared interests. It encourages distrust and infighting which is used by these political figures who can swoop in and convince people that they are there to protect them from the opposing group whose entire existence is seen as a threat. As King puts it at the beginning of the episode, no one wants to think they wasted their life only to realize they've been following a lie. And that's what makes Belos so powerful, he creates a scenario where others are extremely unlikely to turn their backs on him. Belos sort of alludes to it when he threatens Lilith back in season 1. He uses a lot of the same rhetorics used by real-life cult leaders, and what makes him so despicable is that he truly believes in everything he preaches. He actually believes that witches and demons are inherently evil savages who don't deserve to live. He views others as entirely disposable, as proven by his memories, and he shows no remorse over harming and killing them because Belos himself is a representation of this us versus them thinking, who sees himself as a human savior who is there to save the world from the depravity of the demon realm. He's a delusional 
man who convinced himself that everything he does is for the greater good and as such it's obviously justified. It's actually fascinating how he kind of represents a lot of the ideas of the times he came from, especially this close-mindedness and tendency to dismiss the things you don't understand slash don't like as dangerous and evil. This is actually how the witch trials operated back in the day. There were many ways to determine whether someone was a witch, such as throwing the accused person into the nearest body of water because it was believed that someone who's innocent would sink, whereas a witch would be rejected by the water and simply bob on the surface. More often than not, people accused of being witches became victims due to fear, typical petty fights within the community, or good old prejudice. And Philip knows better than anyone how to take these fears and biases and direct them towards those who could possibly intervene with his plans. He's a fanatic who won't hesitate to exploit any perceived weaknesses, which allows him to manipulate people like Luz, whose compassionate and kind nature makes her a perfect target for someone like him. His warped sense of right and wrong allows him to avoid these pesky human feelings such as guilt and use others however he pleases. What's notable is that despite his claims that he's doing it all for the good of humanity, he doesn't hesitate to eliminate Luz once it's clear that she won't support his cause. He mocks her openly more than once and dismisses her, her valid points. He's an amazing amazing character for it to lose who approaches this foreign world with so much curiosity and fascination. There are some really interesting parallels between the two of them, both getting lost in the demon realm but having opposite reactions to it. With Luz quickly falling in love with this magical world, she always dreamed of finding and Belos making it his life mission to get out and destroy everything in the process. His own mind reveals just how far his corruption goes, the pictures in his mindscape portraying his supposed victories over evil. It's only when you go deeper that you uncover the real memories of his, buried deep down and hidden from view. It's a very meaningful visual representation of his real intentions, allowing us to see that, that on some level he recognizes that in his pursuit of his goals he turned himself into something vile and unrecognizable. Can't reason with crazy. If you pay attention to the paintings in the background, you will notice that they tell the story of Philip Wittebain's life prior to becoming Bellos, depicting what happened to him and his brother Caleb. Until season 3, it was our only indication of what exactly made Philip become Bellos or why he was so hell-bent on destroying witches. In thanks to them, we finally have a chance to hear what happened to him thanks to Masha. Local lore suggests that the brothers Wittebane met a real witch from another world. Her name was Evelyn. She dazzled him with magic and visions of a strange yet beautiful place. He used a secret code to travel between worlds. Philip set off to save his brother and bring the witch to justice, but neither were ever seen again. Sounds like Big Bro got a hot witch girlfriend and Lil Bro got upset. You see, it wasn't enough that he killed Caleb once, no, he had to create copies of him just so that he could use and torture them relentlessly, evidently enjoying the sense of control over him. What's crucial is that in all of the paintings, his brother's eyes are invisible, as if carved out of the pictures, possibly as a manifestation of the memory becoming blurry and hard to recall after all these years, or as a sign of Philip's hurt and hatred following his brother's quote-unquote betrayal. Knowing everything we know about Philip's past provides even more insight into the circumstances regarding the existence of Grimwalkers. It doesn't feel as much as Philip creating them out of love and longing, but rather as a twisted desire to punish his brother, even further for not following the same path as him. When he refers to Hunter as a better version of an old friend, what he's essentially saying is that he's an improved version of someone he used to know, someone who didn't allow him to abuse him. By keeping the memory of his brother alive, he creates a scenario that offers him a sense of power over him, an illusion of what could have been if only things went his way. Philip is a man who holds grudges and is stuck in the old ways, completely rejecting any kind of change. While his brother realized that witches aren't to be feared, Philip used everything he learned to justify his hatred and form a plan to remove the evil for good even if it meant doing incomprehensible things and throwing his life away to achieve this goal. What I've always found fascinating about Philip is that despite his hatred for magic, he still carved the glyphs into his body and used Palisman to sustain him, essentially turning himself into a being made of magic. He had to become the very thing he hated the most in the world because it was the only way to destroy it for good. This is not something that many villains would be willing to do, especially given his disgust towards magic and magical beings. 
things. His delusions of righteousness are enough to make him justify everything he's done, even killing Luz, who's one of his own, simply because she refuses to agree with him and rightfully calls him out. He is so detached from humanity, having spent centuries in the boiling aisles, he's willing to sacrifice an innocent human child, a child who helped him, because in his mind his way is the only right way. Possibly the best indication of Philip losing what was left of his humanity was reinventing himself as Bellos. He admits that it's because he never bothered to hide his prejudice towards witches and demons of the Isles and was eventually chased away from every place he visited because he was seen as untrustworthy and dangerous. After realizing that in order to use the draining spell he will need to gain people's trust, he changed tactics and created a cult-like following pretending that he can speak to the Titan and was tasked with spreading his will. Hunter sums it up very well in thanks to them. You were tricked. That's what Bellos does, he tricks people. And it's honestly everything you need to know about Bellos. He will use everything at his disposal to achieve his goals and, and people's trust and loyalty can be a powerful weapon in the wrong hands. He tricked Luz into helping him meet the Collector, he tricked people of the Boiling Isles and he tricked Hunter, hiding the truth about his origins from him and earning himself his undying loyalty. He even tricked the Collector himself, the most powerful being in the universe and once he got the draining spell he decided that he doesn't owe him his promised freedom. Luz, what did you see? Like I said before, Hollow Mind rises the stakes impossibly high, both in terms of individual arcs and when it comes to the overarching story. It's a turning point which marks the moment where everyone has to make a choice whether to believe Bellas and rejoice in anticipation for the Day of Unity or choose to oppose him and try to find a way to prevent him from succeeding. It is the episode that single-handedly changed the curse of the series, giving the show a darker and more sinister tone. It is no longer just a story about a girl who happened to stumble upon a magic world and is eager to discover its mysteries. With the enemies clearer than ever before, the characters are forced to pick sides, face their own mistakes and find a way to prevent a full-on genocide. As expected, this leaves the characters with many unfinished storylines and changes the dynamics going forward. It's a sort of point with no return, the moment in the story when all the cards are on the table and we are anxiously awaiting the next move. And the show does it very well, using nods to previous episodes and expanding on the lore and character arcs introduced to us before. Like I said before, the Owl House, despite having only 25 or less minutes per episode, sets up the storylines and expands on the world better than a lot of other stories which struggle to do the same with much more time. Another thing that I really like about this episode is that it can be watched many times and each time you will find something new that you didn't notice before. Be it the detail that went into the background picture portraying Flip's past, or even the way Luz's chest falls and rises quickly once Belos reveals his true nature, as if she's on the verge of a panic attack. A truly insane amount of thought and effort went into this episode and it's no surprise that many fans consider it to be their favorite. It shows just what animation as a medium is capable of doing, conveying stories in a way that no other storytelling medium can or at least not as efficiently as animation. You can almost feel the tension and it keeps the viewer on the edge of their seat basically from start to finish. Each new revelation is more shocking and impactful than the other. It's very satisfying to see a show that takes time to develop the themes and characters, often in very little time, building tension and not trying to one-up the audience, and instead rewarding them by confirming the theories and providing satisfying payoff for the previously introduced arcs. Way too many writers try to be smarter than their audience, pulling unexpected twists left and right and always trying to be on top. And while it's important that writers are a step or two ahead, it makes for a much more fun and entertaining watch if you can pick on the clues left in the show and piece them together trying to guess what's going to happen next. The Owl House, despite its young target audience, doesn't shy away from difficult and often dark themes. It also doesn't insist on spoon-feeding the audience every single bit of information and allows the viewers to reach their own conclusions. Even if sometimes it means that we figure out something way earlier than the show is able to expose it, it's still fun to watch to see if our predictions will be confirmed. Even as a child I remember being frustrated when shows I watched did that, breaking the immersion just to verbally guide me through what's happening on screen in case I didn't catch that. It's important for writers to have trust in their audience and believe that they understand what you are trying to say. And the Owl House does that, which allows them to introduce emotionally compelling and thought-provoking character acts and storylines while making sure that the viewers remain invested the whole time. I got to decide what my future looked like when I chose to be a witch and I want them to have that option too. Unfortunately, with the show being cut short, a lot of things had to be rushed and we'll probably never know all of the details regarding Philip's past, his relationship with Caleb, 
and other interesting aspects of his story. But I for one think that the show actually kind of benefits from Philip's backstory relying largely on subtext. What I mean is, he was born a long, long time ago. He's a name mentioned in the history books and a genocidal maniac whose warped sense of reality allowed him to justify all the despicable things he did. It makes sense for some aspects of his story to be lost in history and never to be revealed. It actually adds another layer to his character, makes him even more dangerous than we initially thought. It also shows how prejudice and hatred corrupt you, stripping you off of your humanity. What makes Philip so scary is that he chose this. He chose to reject the good things that the demon realm has to offer, he chose to view everyone as his enemies, and he chose to destroy things and people close to him, never making any meaningful connections in his life. And it's scary, yes, but it's also sad. This man willingly chose a life of hatred, paranoia and isolation. He's a bitter asshole with a huge god complex, who wasted his entire life because of a delusional need to prove that it was all worth it. He chose to become the thing he hated the most because once his mind was set, there was no line he wouldn't cross. And it's such a jarring contrast with Luz, who chooses to be kind, open and hopeful, no matter what life throws out her. She is not perfect by any means, but she is capable of admitting that she made a mistake, apologizing and trying to make up for it. Just by being her own accepting and supporting self, she managed to change the lives of so many people. Pairing her with a villain as sickening and cruel as Bells, we truly see why she is the heart of the story and how she managed to be a positive influence on those around her. She is everything that Bellos is not. She rejects the bigoted and close-minded values represented by him and counters them with her own open and honest nature. She is still very much capable capable of being selfish or dishonest at times, but what separates her from Bellos is that she's trying to be the best version of herself and shows genuine regret when she messes up. In Philip's mind, he's incapable of messing up. After all, why would he hold himself accountable if it's all for the greater good? I could go on and on about this show and this episode specifically, and I really don't think I'm capable of doing it justice. There's just so much nuance and clever storytelling that converting all of it in one video is practically impossible unless I make it 5 hours long. It's a shame that Disney never realized what kind of gem they have on their hands, but I admire the people who made this show possible for managing to tell a complex, thought-provoking and compelling story despite everything. It truly really speaks of their skill that despite a limited time to flesh out everything they wanted, Bellos still manages to be one of the best Disney villains ever created, capturing the death and wickedness of some of the most iconic villains, such as Frollo or Maleficent. With two more episodes until the end of the series, I'm sure this won't be my only video about the Owl House, because I absolutely fell in love with this world and these characters. I really wanted to cover Hollow Man in first, because it's a truly amazing episode that combines all of the best elements of the entire show. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe, and let me know what you think in the comments section. I really love making these videos, and your support means the world to me. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time!